Um, well, yeah, uh, I will be here today to present something about the work of Ernst Götsch, who uh, I've been living with for the past half year. And uh, so first of all, I would like to thank him for giving me, or, yeah, giving me the trust to be here today and representing his work in his name, and um, also for the work that he's done and to be able to deliver this content today. Um, what I'll be representing is uh, a part of the philosophy that he has uh, put behind the centropic agriculture and that's defining centropic agriculture and then some of the mechanisms that he uses in order to uh, farm in the way that he has, uh, that he does it. And um, yeah, so first of all I would like to introduce a little bit about what he's done. In Bahia in Brazil, he uh, bought a piece of land in 1984, which 300 hectares of which were severely degraded and acidified. The site had been completely deforested by a logging company. And um, yeah, the soils were ex in an extremely um, critical state and uh, not much vegetation was able to be supported there. And he had the, um, the intention to establish cacao trees there, which everybody told him would be impossible. All the authorities said, this is impossible to grow here, you're never going to be able to do this successfully. And um, then he developed a set of techniques in order to establish cacao trees in these places that were primarily severely degraded. And now, after 34 years, the place looks like this. <laughs> I mean, you can see here where it's really, really green. In the bottom, that's where he actively manages. This is where he really has the most biodiversity, the most, uh, as far as animals are concerned, um, the most fruit production. It's, you can see all the bananas sticking out the top. In the other forest, they've already left for the most part. And uh, the cacao is producing less now because um, the trees are closing. But in this part, he really has a super production and um, that's where he manages actively. And um, so what I will explain now is some of the philosophy that he has, um, that defines the centropic agriculture. So together, all life on this planet creates one macroorganism. And together, communities of plants create the cells in this organism. And these cells then create the organs of the planet. And that is to say, the biosphere is what is actually giving our planet its breath. And just like plants are just cells within the uh, macroorganism of the planet, our planet is just a cell within an even bigger macroorganism. And this organism is uh, acting according to a certain set of laws, which all the cells it contains are bound to. And um, the first of these laws is that of syntropy. So the macroorganism works according to the principle of unconditional love and cooperation. And through this, it is creating more than what was. It's always exponentiating life. It's always complexifying energies. And this is how all cells in the macroorganism should also be working. If the macroorganism is subjected to competition or a cell within the macroorganism, competition will for, or life will not be able to thrive under the means of competition. And this will lead to scarcity. And under the principle of competition, scarcity has the potential to lead to war. And war will lead to death. And the system, the cell, will die. The next principle is sustainability. If the macroorganism is subjected to 100% sustainability. Life is not able to evolve, and this causes a stagnation. And within this cell, the stagnation then causes a crisis. So only under the principle of unconditional love and cooperation, life is able to reproduce, which causes abundance. And this abundance will create peace, which is the stage for life to keep on going and reproduce again. And this process will go on and on. And this is the only way that the macroorganism can keep on thriving and any cell within it. So the next law is that of uh, rhythm. 
This rhythm is what is a determining a certain cycle that is present anywhere within the macroorganism. And the first stage in the cycle is that of disturbance. So this happens on the big as, lo as well as on the small scale. And after, well this is, we made a forest clearing and to replant, to rejuvenate the forest. We didn't kill the forest, we rejuvenated it. We organized all the organic material, it's going to decompose, become fertilizer. And this is what brings forth a G regeneration. New plants are planted, we have corn again, which is an early successional plant, and this is raising our trees. It's basically a propagator emitting humidity, creating shade for our cacao trees to grow underneath. And um, so basically, the next stage in the cycle is a fruitification or reproduction of the organism, which then goes on to transition, which is a preparation for the next disturbance again. And so in this way, the cycle is repeated over and over on the large scale as well as on the small. And soon after a disturbance in the system, the first pioneer plants start to come and colonize, and together they create the first community of plants, the first macroorganism, which will eventually give birth to the next consortium of plants and reproduce again. And by this means, natural succession takes place. One macroorganism of plants gives birth to the next. And by this way, plants establish and actually co-define who will be the best suited successor for them. And um, the next principle is that of stratification. This is actually what I did my study on in Ernst Farm. I hand drew maps on scale on millimeter paper <coughs> of his forests. And um, this is a certain example from a certain piece. And this piece, because it was just one row of trees, there is not all stratuses occupied in this certain example. And, uh, but what I can explain you is here we have cacao trees. These are the purple ones at the bottom. And uh, above that we have canopy trees. These are sombrero mexicano. It's a butterfly pea tree, I think in English. And uh, we have here marang, avocados, another marang. And, um, then we have here the yellow trees. These are the emergents that are now starting to grow up. And actually after the management, the emergent trees will be put in the right proportion again to the canopy trees. So right now you see the emergent trees a bit slower, but after the management, this will be uh, settled again. And the same place, I've also, this was my actual work. I would make maps on scale. I would put grids into the forest and I would hand draw these maps to show how big each tree is and how they are layered above each other. And then by this, because I did on millimeter paper, I could calculate how much space each tree is actually taking up <coughs> and calculate how much shade is being given to the different stratuses. And then also, this is the same place again, after management, how much shade is being reduced or how much uh, canopy size is being reduced after management or during a management. Could, could, could you flip back and forth between these two images? Yeah. So this was uh, the exact same place. And you can see that um, before the cacao was completely, was 100% shade, probably even more. I haven't uh, finished uh, the calculation of it yet, but uh, I will publish this research soon and um, then you could also read it if you're interested. And um, then within this, the approximation that Ernst always makes is that he removes 80%, 70 to 80% of the foliage and uh, branches within the canopy trees. And this causes a certain, this cycle within the forest that you have, it closes, that's the transition, then you prune it, that's the disturbance, it causes regeneration, the trees grow really rapidly again, they, and all the trees are stimulated, and this causes them a fruit production. In the places where Ernst doesn't prune, there is very few, there's basically no fruit, it's very little. Whereas in the places where he does prune, the production is huge. I mean, sometimes the trees, they even fall down because there's too much fruit hanging on it. And um, so, yeah, 
And uh, I also have a picture of the same place. So this was before the management, and then this was after. And basically within the management, it's the idea to put all the trees within the right proportion and context to each other, so that they all get this feeling of um, contentness, being placed in the right subject to their uh, partners or their neighbors. And um, by this, you create overall help and in the system. And so this is also another example of this process where Ernst is pruning some trees. Um, so he's basically just climbing up and every tree is retained within the actual shape that the tree would naturally grow in. It's just reduced by about 70 to 80 percent. And by keeping this shape, the tree remains overall contentness and happiness but it's rejuvenated so that all the trees underneath the cacao trees, they really um, thrive on this disturbance. They're from a disturbance system, as Ernst calls it. Are we allowed to ask questions? Or do we uh, maybe after. We should just at the end. Okay. Yeah. And so this is also the same place again in pictures. This was uh, before. Flip, flip again, flip. Yeah, and this was after. <coughs> And um, in the end, we, these acai palm trees here, he actually cut the tallest one as well because this is a tree from this canopy stratus, and here it's actually growing above the canopy. So he uh, felled one of them. The acai is a tree, it always makes a new growth from the bottom. And uh, so it's always rejuvenating itself. It really has a dynamic. And um, yes, yeah, so I, it's a bit hard to see, but all the trees, they remain within the shape that they, um, like the actual form of the tree is just, um, it's lightened, so to say, of um, excessive leaves and uh, rejuvenated. And the result of this is that the cacao trees, they are usually able to respond within two or three weeks in this manner. They produce a huge amount of red leaves and the whole place lights up red. <laughs> the whole plantation looks like it's just a firework of red lights. <laughs> and then um, after this, I mean, here you can see it, the whole place is full of it. They're actually turning green now. Some of the leaves that are created in this moment are this big. Usually cacao leaves are like this, but all of a sudden they come out like this. It's ridiculous. And this is then uh, setting the stage for fruit production and uh, flowering. Those <laughs> pictures are actually mixed up. <laughs> The trees flower first, of course, and then they make the fruits. But, um, yeah, so this is actually a really huge part in Ernst's work, the management. And it doesn't just happen in the trees, but also in the um, early successional stages where he plants vegetables to bring up the trees, together with other um, plants that are adapted to the soil. The focus of Ernst's work is not really on bringing in nutrients, it's on encouraging and optimizing the processes according to which the natural species succession is able to restore and regenerate soils on its own. So it's not our work to really bring nutrients, but it's our work to optimize the processes according to which the forest is able to make nutrients available again. And um, a byproduct of this work is a huge amount of organic material that will cover the soil and protect it, retaining water. And um, a huge part of this is also wood, which is what's now forming the black soil that's typical to his forests. I mean, I told you can still see it in some parts, the soil before it. There's nothing except the red clay, the orange clay. And in some places, there is black soil like this. And this was within a plantation that um, he didn't even manage, that I rejuvenated. It was a sort of forest that was, um, it wasn't producing much fruits and I clear cut the whole thing and I replanted um, vegetables together with all the trees. So he planted really every five to 10 centimeters a cacao tree together with the fruit tree. And then you have a huge amount of trees that are then able to co-define each other. Who is best so, uh, fitted for this spot here and the conditions here? Did you say is every it, five to 10 centimeters? Yeah. I mean, you really put uh... <laughs> the thing with uh, this work is that you really plant super dense and it grows close, 
but through the management you harmonize the plants again by opening it up again and then it's always this uh, breath of closing, opening, closing, opening and through this you really encourage the plants to grow much more vigorously and healthily and um, so yeah, the organic material is a huge byproduct of this and um, this was within uh, the plantation that I made I planted grasses together with corn these are fast growing savanna grasses and the grasses, they make huge root systems, they go really deep, they open up the soil and as you prune the grasses, they emit this information of new growth to all the other plants present. So after I, I also planted radishes together with the grasses to help them uh, grow up, to create like a kind of propagator. And um, after I harvested the radishes and pruned the grasses, this is what it looked like. And just seven days later, this is what the corn did. So, and then a few days later it started flowering and it made uh, really nice uh, corn cobs. I did use manure in this plot, but uh, not excessive amounts. The idea is kind of that in some situations you supply a little bit of manure <coughs> to convince the plants to start growing. And, but in most cases um, we also made some trials of not using any manure at all and just using plants to prune and encourage this process between the plants of making nutrients available and emitting this information of new growth to get a fruit production. And uh, yeah. So then this was uh, my presentation and thank you for listening. When you plant these trees at 5 to 10 centimeters, yeah. that means millions of seedlings. Yeah. Where do you get these seedlings from? And uh, more importantly, are they monoclonal or are they populations? Well, what we usually did was uh, we went around in the forest because there is a lot of fruit trees everywhere. And we just picked all the fruits that were in season. And um, what Ernst told me one day, which I really liked, was that um, he just plants the fruits that are in season, the seeds that he has right now. And all the other trees, he doesn't even have the right to plant because only the birds and the other animals know the right place for uh, Kobe, uh, Eritrina, yeah. all these other trees. And so, and they also enjoy the act of planting. So why would he go and plant there when he knows that the birds also love doing it? <laughs> and then, it's like, they have this process. They're not competing with each other. They're co-defining. Together they are defining who will be the best suited individual for this place, in this uh, situation, for this soil type, for this. And because I'm planting seeds, you have a huge amount of genotypes, a huge amount of phenotypes, and then you really uh, get uh, somebody that's fitted for the spot also. And, and do, you, do you then select, for you go into the forest and you pick the fruit from the sweetest tree or whatever? Yeah, um, or do you just pick anything? No, um, obviously, especially for cacao, which was uh, the main plant to be established. Oh, the, the cacao you reproduce this way as well? Yeah, yeah. and so the cacao, I would, uh, I would always ask Ernst, where is there a nice cacao tree okay. that I can pick fruits from? And then he would tell me, go to this, this, this one. And I would pick fruits, the nicest ones I could find, and uh, plant them. And what was also interesting is that if you eat the fruit before, he says the trees, they grow better. For example, the cacao, it has a, around the seed, it has really nice uh, white flesh that's super sweet. So he says if you really lick it good and really uh, enjoy the, the taste of the cacao, then uh, it will grow better. <laughs> I don't know why. Well, that probably makes sense because fruits are designed to be eaten by animals yeah. so the yeah. seeds are carried. Yeah. So many fruits will only germ many seeds will only germinate after they've gone through an intestinal tract. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. shit your cacao. <laughs> 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 we have another question here. Yeah? Ah, so then, then you'll be next. Okay, yeah. I can be next uh, uh, about the prune. Yeah. Uh, uh, like yesterday, you were a Taco Blonde, uh -huh. and I also know that um, about the connect the pruning, there are so many different visions in there. Like Taco says, when you prune, you make a disbalance between above ground branches and the roots. Uh -huh. And every unbalance, he says, 
creates diseases or is a chance for diseases. Mm -hmm. So here this system is based on pruning. Yeah. So every time there's an unbalance. So what will Ernst Kutch say about that? Well, um, what I've learned in my school is that when you prune a plant, it causes a shift in the hormonal balance of the plant. If, whether it be a tree, a, a grass, I don't know, any kind of plant, if you remove the apical growth point, the source of oxygen is removed, and this allows cytokinin and gibberellic acid, which are produced in the roots, to rise up into the plant. And these are both hormones which are huge group growth inducers. Both of these hormones, if you we used it in the greenhouse in our school on cucumbers, you also all of a sudden get leaves like this big and these plants that grow all over the place and they get really ill because it's an unnatural amount of this hormone that they're being subjected to. But um, the theory of Ernst and the hypothesis is that when you prune <laughs> the trees, they uh, emit these hormones within themselves, but they also spread it into the mycorrhiza and the, the mycorrhiza then tr distributes it to the other trees like the cacao and that's why you get a, a reaction within the cacao trees so fast that they really uh, they pop up again and they make all these new leaves because the organic matter is not decomposing yet there's no new fertilizer in the system, nothing has changed except the amount of light and the fact that all the trees are in a new new invigorated growth state and this is distributed throughout the whole system and um, you can really just based on intuition see how healthy and um, vigorous the system becomes after he prunes I mean every single tree is exactly in the nice shape they're all in the right context to each other and this is super and uh, yeah. some people would say the Tarko will say well if you don't prune very nice, healthy <laughs> crop yeah. and orchard. Yeah. So I would like to have a discussion between these two. Yeah, maybe we need to bring some yeah. researchers from <laughs> Vargay, my friend. Too. We saw Ernst. that he had a very sweet life only with the production of those three. Yeah. And what you see there is a much uh, more uh, um, dense biodiversity. So many of those trees, they are just there to help the productive trees. Yeah. Yeah. Because he had just a straight line with some production trees. And, uh, I didn't see many um, wood trees like this in here. Yeah, yeah. This is don't really. Don't forget, these are different species. So. Yeah. And um, this is something that um, Ernst and me talked a lot about, and that I'm really looking forward to try within Europe. Is um, there are really certain trees. We've pruned them so much historically that even nowadays our culture says we should still prune them and we have these nice coppice trees of the uh, tilia, for example, we have the uh, poplar. I've seen it in some places where it's really kept like a coppice willow. Uh, we, we have the willow, of course, we have um, the elm, which is nowadays forgotten that it really likes pruning, <laughs> so it's probably getting diseased. Then we have also the ash, also the same story as maybe the elm, because this is not a uh, a certain fact, but it could definitely lead to a part of this because historically these trees were pruned in the midsummer to feed to cattle. And nowadays we don't prune them anymore and they get ill. So if you make a really dense planting of uh, trees that you can prune in midsummer together with your apple trees, <laughs> I believe that you would get an absurd amount of fruit production. Because as you rejuvenate the system, just as they're maturing their fruits, it, um, yeah. From what I've seen in Brazil, it would be, yeah, the results would be uh, off the top. We have another question here. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, you sort of already answered it a little bit, but uh, this is a tough question first. It's like, do you prune the cacao tree as well? Yeah. Okay. Um, so you do this in a tropical landscape, mm -hmm. where there's a different, let's say, uh, climate, in the sense that there's moisture all year round, it's very heavy, yeah. and it's very warm, so you see results very quickly. Yeah. Would you translate this to the Netherlands? And, I, and how would you? Portugal. I know they, they, tried, they had an experiment in Portugal. Yeah. I actually believe that in our climate here, the results in that might be a tiny bit slower, but I think it's easier to do this because we have winter and the climate is less harsh. So there it's really, you always have sun, you have these heavy rains, it's really important that you do everything correctly. 
the whole year round, things are growing so fast mm -hmm. that if you stop to manage for a month, the whole place is overgrown and you can start from scratch again. <laughs> no, not this fast, but if you don't manage for half a year or a year, the place is... Yeah. <laughs> so it would be easier that you have less work in, in here because there's, there's a slower system here, you're saying? It's not necessarily slower, but I think it's uh, a lot easier to manage. And um, what I'm now doing, because I work a lot with the vegetables in Brazil, mm -hmm. I have some experiments uh, with vegetable polycultures based on the um, interaction and the processes between plants. So I used um, about half of the recommended manure based on soil samples. And then I planted in one location red beets. And then again, the same spacing of red beets together with radishes to create a small propagator and to uh, um, grow faster than other plants that would like to establish themselves there. And then my weeding actually becomes a harvesting. And then I planted the same spacing of red beets and radishes again together with grass and clover. And it's really, I sold the grass and clover really dense at the recommended rate for a uh, pasture. And uh, then I will cut it with the scissor to prune it, release the information of new growth. And uh, now I'm testing what the results will be based on um, the amount of water I need, labor costs, soil samples before and after, uh, yield, yield quality, so bricks content, dry matter content, so on. and. And I also have more of a personal experiment where I'm planting a lot of different polycultures uh, in between rows of corn. So I have these rows of corn that I planted together with lupins, uh, grass and clover. Aaron's actually now told me that grass and clover is not the best thing for corn. <laughs> but uh, we'll see what happens. And um, I will also plant beans together with the corn and I have lettuces to fill the space uh, rather fast. And, and then in between, I always have these rows with uh, other vegetables like mm -hmm. kohlrabi, zucchini, peas, uh, mm -hmm. carrots, uh, all kinds of different polycultures. Again, then with uh, plants for pruning, like the grasses, and uh, other cover crops like veg, clover, um, so on and so forth. And um, yeah, then I would like. Still have another question. Yeah. Yeah, I'm really interested in scaling up. We know that these systems deliver in terms of biomass production, but what farmers are interested in is not biomass production, what farmers are interested in is livelihoods. They're interested in having money to pay the school fees and build a house and go on holiday like everybody else. So the question I have is, from what you've seen, you know, from what the history of this system has been, is it scalable? Are other farmers who are not gurus like Ernst Skirch, but just normal guys who want to make a living, adapting this system and finding that it works for them. Is it spreading? And if the answer is yes, great, how can we make it spread faster? And if the answer is no, why not? What's scalable? Like, is it more hackers or is it more people doing it? Both. Okay. Um, well, the <coughs> thing is that um, Ernst, he's working on uh, a certain set of machineries. He's already uh, cons um, developed them in his um, drawings and notes. Now he's uh, looking for investors and mechanics that can build them. And this machinery set will allow farmers to really scale this up with having smart, intelligently designed machinery that is light and uh, that does an intelligent job. And then you could plant on millions of hectares corn or soybean together with the grasses and long term improve soil quality, improve soil water uh, holding capacity and all these things reduce the need of fertilizer, reduce the need of pesticides, and farmers would be able to um, adapt this. What I think he's working on is to um, scale the system step by step with conventional farmers. He has a group of, well, there are alternative farmers in Goiás, in Brazil, that are now going to do first trials with this machinery. They've already um, redesigned the machinery they already have to do the intelligent job that he asked them to do. And um, then now they're going to plant the grasses in rows together with corn rows. And, um, and in the future, he also would like to include trees in these uh, systems and then develop them more and more with time to become more and more complex. So it's not a one time, let's do it now, but it's uh, a process as well. So, no, so currently no other farmers in the neighborhood have copied this system. It's, a, pro it's a project, it's not yet happened. Well, there is a lot of places that he's advising, but um, I believe that when you build a farm, especially in this kind of way, it's an expression of yourself. 
and the way that you manage it, it's, it's an expression of yourself. That's why Taco and Walter and people, they say, oh, I like the trees, how they grow. Um, they're fine. <laughs> and other people, they say, no, we should really prune it. And um, then there's a difference of opinions. Is it better, is it worse? But that's put aside. The whole place is the expression of yourself. So if Ernst is teaching a person, this is uh, how we should do it. They also add their own touch to it. So in Portugal, I can tell you that it is really spreading. And in Brazil as well, but not necessarily like right in the region where it is. Okay. Yeah. We have another question here. It should be the last one. Um, you were mentioning manure, and I wanted to ask: Are there any animals included in this system? Uh, normally. In all of the plantations that Ernst planted, he planted in really degraded soil, like I said, and he didn't use manure at all, no manure at all. And he just added a small amount of chalk within the rows of the trees, not across the whole area, just in the rows where he planted. He would add a small amount of chalk, and by encouraging the processes present in natural species succession, he then was the plants, not he, the plants made nutrients available and as he was encouraging this process and favoring this process the plants developed a more and more healthy soil and ecosystem. That was a reply is that there were no animals? Uh, in they used to have a lot of animals but nowadays they only wild have animals dogs. Or there are wild animals but they also used to keep um, pigs, chickens and um, I think that in the past? Do they continue to having them or not? No, nowadays they don't have all these animals anymore. Right. Well, um, we also had it with the dogs once, you know, Ernst, he's really um, neat with how he organizes the organic material in the plantation. So he first he goes through, he prunes all the trees, and then it looks like a huge mess. All this stuff is falling on the ground, hanging in the trees, and it's a huge mess. And then afterwards, after he's pruned everything, he makes a kind of, or as he's already going through pruning the trees, he's looking, where is there some organic material missing, is, where is there a lot, where... Where, where do I distribute this stuff? And then he really, it's really like really neat how he organizes it. And then the animals, they come in and they reorganize everything. <laughs> and uh, we had it with the dogs that sometimes, uh, one time he was pruning right next to the house and he made a really neat job. He really did everything super. And by the next morning, the dogs had taken all the material <laughs> into the driveway. <laughs> <laughs> so we built fences around it, so they would do it. Okay. So, but yeah, the chickens, they're always scratching the soil, and the pigs as well, and the geese, they actually got rid of because uh, they were killing some of the cacao trees. What's, what's interesting also that uh, at, uh, all his neighbors, they have the witch broom disease in the cocoa plantations. And at Ernst, it was really impressive to see that there was not, not at all this well, disease. Well, a little bit. Yeah, really like a small bit. But what he says, the witch's broom is a reaction of the tree to improper pruning. Because it's basically the tree has made this branch, and now he's realizing, oh, this branch wasn't really intelligent, I have to get rid of it, so, okay, I'll put a witch's broom in. <laughs> or I'll let this fungus get inside there and it will go away. And um, by pruning in the right way, he eliminates, for the most part, the fact that this is present. What he's also noticed uh, through his observations is that when there's, a, um, if there's trees that are not in the right context to each other in a higher stratus, and a cacao tree is underneath, he will also get a witch's broom, <coughs> even though he's completely fine. It's just the trees above him that are having a conflict, and then below the tree will also have a you will produce the witch's fruit. Thank you very much. I think we can...